Okay, thank you. I'm Frederick, and uh, during the weekdays, I work uh, in IBM selling hardware. And uh, Majid and I work together in the past, and uh, I really appreciate his, uh, his skill and his um, enthusiasm and his dedication. And it seems that Shaima shares a similar dedication, so it's wonderful to meet you guys, and thank you for inviting me for this session. I live in Dubai, and hopefully the signal is clear. Uh, you can hear what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, this talk is about alternate platforms. Uh, and what I mean platform, I mean hardware uh, CPUs. I'm not talking about alternate platform as in Mac OS or Linux or Windows. I'm, I'm focused purely, let's say, on the hardware, but the hardware also has an operating system. So, so in all, it comes uh, together in the end here. But this is um, a hardware-focused presentation. Thank you. So uh, what do I mean by enterprise workload? So uh, in this session, I selected one uh, typical enterprise workload that uh, most of us know about, even though maybe some of you might feel it's old fashioned. But a typical enterprise workload, uh, and, and th in this example, I will use the Oracle database. Okay. And with this example, we will go through a, a few different iterations here. But in the end, you will understand why there are still alternate platforms, and I'm talking about alternate hardware platforms that are supported by the Oracle database, okay? So the Oracle database was first released in 1979, I believe even before IBM's first relational database, even though it used IBM research uh, to, to build the thing. And it was written in assembly on a wax. So that is of course a very alternate, uh, let's say a platform that is no longer with us. So I will focus here also on platforms that are still available and then hence I just went to the Oracle download side to, to check the latest downloads of the Oracle database. So in 1983, the, the database was rewritten in C and started to support Unix. And of course, since then it, it supported many platforms uh, over the years and the current window, uh, the current, let's say set of architectures that are supported basically is the IBM mainframe running Linux. So IBM, uh, you may or may not be aware, we still produce two different hardware architectures as, that we are selling. We are producing the mainframe that uses the system Z15 processor, which is a separate microprocessor, not x86. We also uh, produce the IBM Power, Power 9 microprocessor. Uh, that is a different product as well, a risk-based CPU. And, and uh, that is what we are doing in IBM at the moment. So Oracle as a software vendor, uh, as a typical enterprise workload supports the mainframe from IBM. It supports um, the Itanium CPU uh, that is, was sold by H HP mainly in the later years, which is an alternate platform. It's a risk CPU, Itanium. Uh, the power platform with the IBM AIX operating system, uh, the Spark, a microprocessor uh, using the Solaris operating system, and of course the x86 CPU uh, and the Linux operating system, as well as the Windows operating systems. Uh, still, you can also get Solaris for x86 based version of the Oracle database. However, I, I think that is a minority and it's an x86 system. So fine, so we have one, two, three, four, four different architectures, which are not x86 that an enterprise workload supports. So, so why is that and what is what is the reason? Um, so we, we can go back to the history and, and see. And you might think that, oh yes, everything is ARM, everything is uh, x86. And you might say ARM is a new thing, so therefore we don't have the legacy to support. We can uh, do a much better job than x86 or we can do a much better job than mainframe. But uh, if you look back, you come to see that ARM architecture actually, uh, which although it's a very, in all of our phones, it was still uh, invented in 1987, the first release. So it is also quite old, I mean, in terms of uh, the legacy. Yes, it is not 1964 when the first IBM mainframe was released or the first x86 came in 1978. So these are the dinosaurs here and the ARM and Spark came about in 1987. Then the Power 9 came in 1990 for the Power, Power 1 chip at that time. Uh, the power chip. So it's a newer architecture than both Spark and ARM. And then Intel Itanium, basically the first chip uh, came about in 2001. And it has been announced end of life, actually. It's the first one of these 
on this page, which are end of life officially. The last order date, I think it is May next month. So if you want to buy any Itanium CPU from HP, uh, then you have to hurry, hurry, hurry. Also the Oracle, the Spark, the old Sun Microsystem Spark architecture, we're now on the M8 uh, version and uh, we believe that there will be no follow-on product. So this is the last chip that they will produce and uh, they will keep selling it until nobody wants to buy it anymore. So it doesn't cost them to keep it alive. And they have promised to keep the Solaris operating system alive until I believe 20, 20, 2034. So, so yes, it's still there in the market. However, uh, we don't anticipate from Fujitsu any new Spark CPU nor from Oracle itself. And it's interesting if you look on this list here, uh, Spark, starting with Sun Microsystem, was always, let's say, fabless operator. So Sun Microsystem never had a chip factory, always licensed or bought, uh, let's say, used technology from, from other vendors, from other founders or foundries to create a processor. So uh, they did never invested in a large plant. Uh, Intel obviously had a large plant and they were always leading. And let's say until uh, 2013, they were always ahead let's say in the manufacturing process, actually only the, the only rival at that time was the power architecture, because if you remember PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, Nintendo and Nintendo Wii, uh, they all uh, used the power processor. So actually the huge volumes, uh, the chip volumes was actually x86 and power at that time, mid 2000. So, um, but again, IBM also went out of the fabrication business. We sold our uh, chip plant so the next generation processors from IBM will be manufactured by Samsung. Okay, so the Power 10 will be manufactured by Samsung and a seven nanometer process. So, so, I mean, yes, we might think we're modern, we go for ARM, but actually we're not that modern. Uh, or x86 is not, it's very old, but it's not that old. I mean, we still have older architectures that are still viable. So these are the viable ones that are still available, although two of them, let's say, are in yellow, they're in risk here for the future. Uh, just to give you an example, so why did Itanium fail? Uh, why, this, why it's not taking over everything? And, and I think what scares everybody in, in, my, in my industry in the late 1990s was the projections. Intel will come out because they just released the Pentium processor, it really killed everything else, but it was still a 32-bit processor. So the Itanium, uh, let's say, projection was that, yeah, it will come out in 1999 and it will grow uh, until... Uh, to a $40 billion business uh, by 2001. And, and of course the chip never came out in 1991 and the projections were toned down eventually. And, and when it did, did launch in 2001, basically, uh, uh, yeah, people realized that the performance wasn't that great. So you see the, the red chart here is actual sales progression. So, so instead of being a $40 billion business, it was a two and a half billion dollar business by 2006. So this really, and by 2006, also uh, uh, ARM released its 64-bit architecture, and uh, or even earlier, 2004 maybe. And Intel came about here and and made the x86 also 64-bit. So this really sealed the fate of the Itanium uh, architecture. But you see here, it's a, it, it is a technical failure in in terms of the performance and the way it got executed. But it's also a financial, uh, purely a financial decision. I mean, if it would have been a $40 billion business, certainly we would have seen Itanium. But what it did was paralyze everybody else that make Sun, IBM, everybody scared. And and um, <clears throat> companies like Silicon Graphics basically withdrew from the whole market because they thought Itanium will take over completely, which never Jack, happened. Uh, so, you have yeah. one minute left for the 10 minutes. Minute and then you have, and you have five minutes Q&A. Oh. So you can take the five yes, minutes yes, of yes, Q&A. So one minute left. So, so uh, yeah, so a little bit of history. So why is it still, uh, uh, let's say, a viable architecture? Sorry for one minute, I will make it a little longer. Uh, but, but it's purely a financial uh, thing here. So if you, if you talk about the licensing cost of, of certain software like Oracle, it's very expensive and it's licensed per processor core. So uh, if you go back here and check, so the, the Power9 processor has eight logical processors per core, which means we can give a very high performance per core. And Oracle punishes the IBM and mainframe architectures uh, by having a different core factor. So that means you have to pay more software license if you run it on power, IBM versus other processors. But even so, and, and there is also uh, for cloud different metrics here. So the reasoning why it's still a viable architecture and people are still buying is that 
I, I'm jumping to the result here basically, uh, is that potentially there is, a, there is a still with this uh, hindrance, there is a chance to reduce the software spend. So the whole reason IBM Power exists today is that it can reduce software licenses from companies like Oracle or IBM. So, so it is not really a technical, oh, it's so much faster or it's so much better. Uh, of course, it is uh, targeted a different type of customer, but the whole, the whole uh, let's say, benefit is that it can reduce your uh, license spend up to 75%. And if you look at the market share, uh, and I, I'm taking again the Oracle numbers here. So, so how much is, is it, is it a viable business? So you see Unix business, which is mainly AIX or Power9 here. It is almost, uh, well, it's about 20% of the whole uh, Oracle cap of, of license sales, or let's say uh, billions of income. So it is still a very viable, let's say, uh, niche to be in. Although, of course, Windows is still bigger and x86 Linux is the biggest. Now, uh, there are other architectures. So uh, very interesting things happened this week. I'm not sure if you followed the news, but NVIDIA uh, bid to acquire the ARM corporation and basically take over the CPU uh, foundry or the, the design of the ARM. And, uh, and there are some CPUs that are in the market that are targeted for the data center. Of course, this is in all your phones. Uh, versions of the ARM, so it's a very, very viable architecture. But then again, just last week, uh, we heard that the UK government may oppose this merger. Okay, so so again, ARM is in the business of licensing its IP to other vendors. They don't produce anything themselves. Nvidia, of course, if they buy ARM, what will happen to to the thing, and what will uh, Nvidia do to it? So there's a great risk in the market, and and of course, people are scared. So, so now UK government is opposing. I believe, I feel it will still happen, the, the merger. We will still have uh, NVIDIA taking over ARM. But what does it mean, for example, for Apple, who just invested and, and released new ARM chips, the M1 chip in the iPad Pro yesterday and, and in, the, in, the, in the MacBooks earlier? So, I mean, um, and, and what does it mean for enterprise workloads? Because as of now, they don't have any servers. They don't sell servers anymore. They stopped in 2002. And basically, uh, will they do it? Will they go forward? And what does this ARM acquisition mean for, for Apple? So, so the, the last, uh, let's say, viable uh, architecture, which is not x86, this is the so-called Risk Five, which is a research project, basically. And there is, it's completely open and anyone can basically implement. So it is a, a little bit behind in terms of the adoption and of course, there is no Oracle database. There is no enterprise workloads. There is hardly virtualization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so, I mean, we, we, have, we have a few architectures and the viability of those is, is purely driven by commercials. If, if it is makes sense commercially to, to deploy on it, that's why they have a place in the market. But risk five here, especially now with the NVIDIA merger of ARM may be a favored architecture for starting with embedded systems and going upwards, maybe to servers. As well. Uh, so, so thank you. I, I know it was a, <laughs> a little bit short, <laughs> but uh, I, 